Welcome to the Astrology Show. My name is Nick from Astrology Explained. Uh, you can find me on Facebook or YouTube. Just search Astrology Explained. Hello, my name is Mike. I'm with Mutual Reception Astrology on YouTube and on Facebook. You can find me on the Mutual Reception Astrology page or the ASA Astrology Shitposting Admins page if uh, you're looking for a little bit more spice in your life. You can also find me on Twitter at Mars at Scorp. Do you want to talk about the elephant in the room, the, uh, the past month, the past year, Saturn and Pluto? Yeah, I think it would definitely be great to talk about the Saturn and Pluto ar archetype and how it's been playing out in the world. I'm really impressed with uh, how much the government has done. I mean, the world has never been shut down like this before. Uh, I mean, every government just, it's, it's incredible, really. I've been following this pretty much since the beginning, COVID-19, when it was uh, really just starting to come out in China and you were starting to see first the cover up of it. And then a little bit later in China, you were seeing um, one of the biggest uh, shutdowns of, you know, a pretty huge city in Wuhan that we've ever seen in history. Um, it was the most amount of people under quarantine that has ever been under quarantine. And really the numbers have only grown since then. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, and yeah, that alone was a lot. And then the fact that it took off so quickly, the, uh, every single government took on what they were doing and it's, uh, it's weird. Yeah, I, I honestly like looking, you know, going back, like I knew the Saturn, Pluto and Capricorn conjunction was going to be something, but I didn't expect this level of sort of the archetype happening, the, the authoritarian control, the, the shutdown. I mean, I, yeah, it, it surprised even me and uh, I knew what was coming at the same time, but yeah. Well, from a kind of a mundane per astrology perspective, what really surprised me was there was a lot of talk in a lot of the mundane astrology groups about how we were coming up to a big economic downturn. Uh, some people online actually got it pretty perfect um, when it would be when the economic downturn would hit and they were talking about how big it would be. And I was scratching my head just trying to understand how we could see after such a big economic boom, the bust that they were seeing coming in the future um, and trying to figure out what could do that. Um, the only thing that I was thinking at the beginning of January um, was when tensions were starting to rise right on the new year between Iran and the U.S., I thought maybe war might affect uh, economic stability. Uh, but it turns out it wasn't. Uh, it was definitely disease. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. And, and I think it's, it almost felt like they were ready for something. I mean, it was just like, Everything was like, oh, okay, here's all our plan. We're, like, it's never happened before with any other virus or any other disease where there's this level of, like, coordination. And not to get conspiratorial, but just the level of, like, shutdown and coordination between the world governments was, was different. Yeah, and I, like, I, I agree with you completely. I didn't I, – it seemed like things were good, and I, you know, I knew that there was the pushback against, you know, President Trump and just kind of the split in the political, you know, different parties. But – I didn't, yeah, I didn't see an economic downturn coming like this either because, yeah, like I was, I, I didn't understand what could cause it. Yeah, I didn't see anything like coming down the pipeline that would be like, okay, this is going to completely alter the structure of reality in a sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, the, the other thing that is, is almost always concurrent with a Saturn-Pluto conjunction is a uh, kind of political repression of the public and the public going through hard times of deprivation. And honestly, what we have is governments to a certain extent uh, doing their best to keep that deprivation from happening. But often while they're doing that, they're picking uh, certain winners and losers. And those winners and losers that are picked uh, can have a huge effect on our future prosperity in the country. What I've thought really interesting is small business and community business has really felt the squeeze from this because they haven't been able to really operate um, as normal in their communities anymore. Whereas many of the larger chains and larger businesses have been allowed to continue. Uh, so 
although there's been uh, some legislation that's trying to ease the burden on small businesses, the more politically connected uh, bigger businesses were the first ones able to access those funds. Um, and so you see a lot of the small business and kind of the, the lifeblood of local communities really getting squeezed right now. And if these, uh, if these, uh, God damn it. <laughs> if we see um, these quarantines continue and if we continue to see these shutdowns of business, there's quite a few of these uh, local and small businesses that are not going to be able to reopen. And I think that that's a real loss um, for our country. I guess I have two questions to that is like, what do you think is different about this Saturn Pluto conjunction, you know, opposed to previous ones? Because I mean, they seem to be more localized to like either certain countries or certain areas of the world or certain types of economies. But now it's, you know, everyone and everything. And yes, I completely agree. And like, you know, is that just the the small businesses being closed down? Is that sort of like the the extreme of like kind of corporatism maybe reaching ahead? I guess I'm looking for a positive. What is the positive that could come from this? Obviously, we know the negatives, uh, losing more small businesses, you know, monopolization, corporatization. But do you see any other positives from this? And like, what, what sets this Saturn-Pluto conjunction apart in your mind from others? Well, I think that this... Uh, well, I'll get into a couple of things, I guess. The last Pluto-Saturn conjunction was during an economic downturn um, in the early 80s. And the big thing that happened during that was actually the beginning of the AIDS crisis. So it was connected with, uh, with a viral disease that had a huge impact on our world. Um, it had a more subtle impact and it had an impact um, on more discrete kind of groups of people. Um, and that was when Saturn and Pluto were in Scorpio together. So do you think it matters uh, with the sign? Do you think just because we're, it's a cardinal sign and just it's Capricorn, do you think that's the difference there maybe, or? I think the sign absolutely matters. And I think in this particular case, you were talking about the positives of what this does. I think that there's a lot of distrust of that's being built, uh, from the public about kind of the end goal of kind of global globalism, global, at least corporate centered globalism. So we're having communities start to realize that you don't want your supply chain, you know, uh, stretched out across the world. Um, you might, you might want to make some of your own medicine. You might want to make some of your own face masks. You might want to make sure that you have the production capability and the supply chain to actually make sure it happens on your local level, make sure it happens on your national level. And so I think that the reaction always to, of Capricorn is kind of a nationalism. So there's this um, kind of broad corporate globalization that Capricorn operates under. Uh, is often race to the bottom capitalism. It often uh, lifts up uh, countries with low uh, worker protections and low environmental protections. So if you kind of think about what, what are square to Capricorn. You've got Libra, which is about, you know, <laughs> cooperation, um, equal and equality. You've got Aries, which is about uh, expressing your own individuality and going for it alone. And then you've got Cancer, which is about like feeling like you have a home and feeling like you're nurtured, you know? So in a, in a sense, all of those energies come up um, because that's spread all throughout us in the population, right? We have people that are <laughs> representing all of those cardinal signs, and that's kind of the underwelling of action against this uh, corporate globalization that's been considered kind of a... Well, it's been considered like it's the end of history, and this is just the way that it's going to go. And I think that the end of history might have been uh, greatly exaggerated. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's true, and you you see like yeah, certain camps like, you know, the the cap the negatives of the Capricorn and the you know, globalization corporatization, it pushes on the individual, my own individual rights. It's like I can't even, if you know, people can't even just there are certain laws and restrictions that it seem arbitrary, or you know, uh, certain speech issues online and stuff, and then you also have yeah, like just the the sense of like people are reacting to all of this 
in this feeling of like, I need a sense of security and safety, which is like uh, the opposite, you know, cancer archetype. And it's like, you know, what will provide me that sense of security and safety? And it's, I guess for me, it's like, if you look outward for that, like whether it's to authority, government, whatever, you know, the, the experts and I guess developing a sense of security inside yourself, which is sort of the lesson of the cancer archetype in general, just with the node being there, obviously the North node moved into Gemini recently and we did see a shift in kind of people's priorities a little bit. Um, but it, like it just from going that like sense of security, reactionary, emotional water type stuff to more, let's, let's question things. Let's analyze, let's think about things more like what is going on. But yeah, I guess just like moving with that, like now at the beginning, when we first had the shutdown, in my opinion, both parties seem to kind of react in a similar way, you know, not both parties, but just people who align themselves on either side, even, you know, quote unquote conservatives, Republicans, they definitely went along with the shutdown for a while. But now, obviously, we're seeing that split where it's become a cliche where Republicans don't wear face masks and Democrats do. And it's just like, it's become a, yeah, a political statement almost. Um, okay, so yeah, I want to just talk about the idea of, uh, you know, so to me, uh, you know, Saturn and Capricorn and the Capricorn architect in general is sort of control comes from authority, like Capricorn is authority. And uh, Saturn in Aquarius when Saturn, you know, Saturn moved into Aquarius this past spring and uh, it's retrograding back into Capricorn this uh, summer and fall. And uh, Saturn Aquarius is more about control from the group and, you know, the, you know, the social, like, you know, Aquarius is about, you know, are you living up to the, the negatives at least, are, are you living up to the norms of the group, the social norms and stuff. And uh, there's this pressure with the face masks uh, in society. Like, I don't know if you've been to the grocery store recently, but I've heard in different parts of the country, people, if you go to a grocery store without a face mask, you get quite a few dirty looks. And it's just uh, definitely represents that split in the, I guess, realities or whatever you want to call it, people's personal preferences and political preferences. The Pluto return, I think, is going to be a, a big part of that. The U.S. is in orb of its Pluto return. It's moving towards it. Uh, and that really uh, brings up aspects of America's shadow, um, often the two tribes uh, in my perspective the two tribes uh, are people that don't uh see anything that america does as wrong and then the tribe that sees everything that america does as wrong yeah i've heard that uh referred to as dimension a and dimension b um different spots um depending on where people stand on certain political issues they basically split into one tribe or the other and this is what's interesting about uh the us right now is back in the day um the end of the roman empire when it was the byzantine empire the biggest split that happened was be because there was two kind of political parties that decided that they were absolute enemies within the society and there's the old saying of a house divided against itself cannot stand um there's been a lot of times over the course of America's history where the political parties have been pretty polarized, but there perhaps has never been a time that is as polarized as now besides the Civil War. Uh, we're, we're coming up on that level of polarization where the side that you don't agree with is becoming more dehumanized in this process. And Perhaps one of the easiest ways to see that right now is through how people see face masks. For the people that think that, um, for pretty much the left side, they're showing their care for their community by putting on their face masks. And it's showing that they're a part of the community and they're willing to make the sacrifice um, for the bigger picture, which is keeping people protected against um, this disease. So it's uh, putting the group above the individual. And then on the right side, you're seeing people wear the mask, or not wear the mask, excuse me. Um, and often they're not wearing the mask because the reality is in lots of places around our country, um, the mask isn't really necessary. Um, when you're out and the mask that we are wearing as the public, there's been a lot of studies that have shown that cloth masks don't really have an impact on whether you spread or get the disease. So there's almost, uh, from the right, there's a sense that uh, the left is just doing it to 
um, show off how much they care. I think that's called uh, virtue signaling nowadays. Uh, and the right or the left just sees the right as being, you know, their typical heartless selves not caring about the group. So it's exacerbating, even in this time of crisis, instead of coming together, um, we're dividing into our kind of natural tribalism. It's interesting to say the least. It is. It's it's sort of like it, it enforces the the stereotypes that each of each holds about the other. Like, and I find it to just be interesting. Like, you know, the, someone who doesn't understand a leftist is a Republican, and someone who doesn't understand a Republican is you know a Democrat. So it's just funny that they each have their they have such strong like this is how the other side is. I know you because this is my idea of you, and like you know they and you're 100 percent right. Like that is partially the motivation on each side and like i would just like to you know i won't go into this too detailed but just um i really think the the pluto eris square that is happening it's between you know pluto and capricorn and eris and aries uh i think that you know in some ways people are people are embodying one or the other and it's out i mean to me that's like you know pluto and capricorn like those people are gonna stick to the capricorn archetype and you know either take on and be like the Karen type and tell people what to do and be like rule mongers or just follow the rules and be like, well, this is what we're supposed to do. I'm going to be a good, you know, a good person in society versus the heiress and Aries people who are kind of taking on that archetype. Like, no, I'm just going to do what I want. Like, this is my, you know, my rights, my individual Liberty, all that stuff. And like, you know, we're seeing that square happening and like that square is throughout the year. It's exact throughout the year in different ways. And so, I definitely think that there is like an underlying tone that's happening between those two planets. And so just to emphasize what you were saying earlier about like the, the cardinal signs being emphasized, like I think Aries is, and with Mars moving there this summer and fall, it will be more emphasized, I guess. Oh yeah. I mean, we're going to have a Mars retrograde, uh, this preview of coming events, but we're going to have a Mars retrograde during our next election. So um, back in the day, Back in the day, I remember in 2016, we were going through a Saturn and Sagittarius, Neptune, Neptune and Pisces square. And a lot of people thought that that was going to be the weirdest election we've ever had. And I remember looking forward at that time and seeing like what was coming in 2020. And I was like, nope, I think 2020 is going to be worse. But there was, there was no way to understand exactly how it was going to be worse. I'd, I'd like to piggyback uh, and talk a little bit more about the Saturn and Aquarius archetype that's uh, really been playing out. Uh, Saturn, uh, Aquarius also rules the internet. And Saturn uh, linking into that rule of the internet, um, you're seeing in a deeper and deeper level more of a crackdown from, you know, these corporate entities that control our social media experience in many ways. I mean, there are definitely ways that you can be free of these major companies like, uh, you know, Google and Facebook and um, Twitter, but there's no audience that's comparable to those places. So you lose something, you know, by moving off of them. These, these companies have taken it on themselves to basically make the decisions on what's true and what's not and what's allowed to be uh, even talked about on their sites and many people have been demonetized or um, simply had their videos not even show up in searches if it went against the party line and the fact that we have uh, these corporations which are not democratic you know um, basically able to impose their uh, censored impose their censored will on the public is also creating a lot of the backlash. I think that's where you get a lot of the, the more um, freedom, the more rebellious aspects of um, the right uh, politically in the US right now come from uh, as a reaction to um, a lot of the crackdowns and the, the controls that are being imposed on their speech through the mediums that allow their speech to be heard. I mean, it is interesting now that, you know, the president did is now looking into kind of pushing back against sort of the, there is definitely a bias online. And that's a whole nother, depending on your views, you would see it as either a bias or a good thing. But there is a certain level of crackdown happening that is, what is, it's like moral policing. It's, it's, it's like, oh, you know, we think we know what's best for people. We think we know, like, you know, you shouldn't say these words or you shouldn't think these thoughts or whatever. 
this moral policing, I mean, to me, that is the Capricorn archetype. And you're right. Now that it's the past decade was the Capricorn archetype mixed with like, you know, there was the whole Uranus Pluto square, which during that time, there was a lot of freedom options on the internet coming out. Like Bitcoin came out during the Uranus Pluto square, a lot of, you know, VPNs and just privatization for the masses basically. And, uh, but now it's like, it's shifting again, where it's like, they're, they're tripling down at this point, I guess, and cracking down even harder. And it's like, yeah, it will be interesting, especially as, you know, and this is a conversation for another video, but just, you know, it's giving us previews into what, Pluto and Aquarius might bring as far as the levels of, because in my opinion, Pluto, as it moves through a sign will, will bring out the negatives, you know, the shit, the shadow, the shadows in the closet of that sign in society. So with Aquarius, it will bring out the shadow of, or the negatives of, yeah, the, the technology that we have. And also, yeah. And anyways, yeah. So I agree with you. And I think uh, it'll be interesting. I think there's enough, I have complete faith in humanity that there's enough creativity and ingenuity that will figure out ways around everything, but you know, it, it's not always easy. Yeah. Just because uh, it kind of brought it up in my mind. Um, one of the, one of the big things that happened during the, the Uranus and Aries square to Pluto and Capricorn was the Occupy movement. So if you think about it back in that day, during that time, um, you had basically the left uh, kind of rising up in rebellion, the progressive left rising up in rebellion. And they got, and this was during a democratic administration, and you saw some of the biggest political crackdowns on the Occupy movement that we've, we've seen, you know, uh, Homeland Security was rolling into town in a lot of places. Um, people were getting rousted, you know, the police were out on the streets. There was a, there was crazy things happening. So it, there was that rebellion um, from the left that happened during that. And now we're seeing the rebellion um, happen from the right. And there were aspects of that rebellion that were happening during the uh, Pluto Uranus square um, with the Tea Party movement too from the right. That won to a certain extent. And that is like the, the basis of Trump getting elected to a certain extent was the victory of Tea Party elements being tired of the way things were. So it's, it's really interesting to see, especially the big outer planet. There's always something that goes along with it. You know, there's always big cycles of history that are playing out. And you can't really get much bigger than the Saturn and Pluto transit that we're going through right now. Knock on wood, of course. Yeah, yeah, especially just for the the tangible effects it has. I mean, Uranus, for all its power it has, it's not as, you don't feel it as much sometimes. Like, a Uranus transit will not hit you as hard in the gut as, say, a Saturn or a Pluto transit. So the two of them together will definitely, definitely do that, yes. And, uh, yeah, we're definitely seeing that now. You know, Pluto brings up the shit, and so it, it like, makes it the worst possible, which is what creates the change. Cause otherwise change doesn't happen. You know what I'm saying? Like if things are okay, if like they're, Oh, okay. It's just kind of comes up every once in a while, like a bad thing, you know, the Pluto thing under the surface, then like people aren't going to change, you know, people aren't going to push back. People aren't going to have that, the need to change with Pluto in my opinion, like it brings the shit up so that people are like, Oh God, that's horrible. Like, and it brings attention to it so that there is that transformation change, whatever you want to call it the point of like it it brings it like throws it up in your face like maybe in your face so that which then instills a reaction in people otherwise people just would not give a shit i mean i don't know how else to phrase that i think as hard as it is um to go to deal with the reality of the saturn pluto um conjunction and kind of uh, the fallout from it the really good news about it is that pluto exposes the rot in the system it exposes the rot in whatever sign it's in. So we're seeing very clearly the rot in our governmental systems, in our corporate systems, in our global uh, structures. And Saturn has come, come along to show that if these things are fully corrupt, you can't just continue to operate under them. Um, the things that are corrupt have to be brought to the surface by that plutonium process seen and dealt with. And the good thing about Saturn is it really keeps you focused on dealing with it. Absolutely. I, I agree with that completely. And I think just, yeah, like it's, it's like 
you know, if we look back at the past decade, which I mean, to me, I call this decade the Pluto and Capricorn decade, you know, obviously it goes back a year or two more, but yeah, you have, I mean, the levels of just, yeah, even in the Obama administration, the levels of authoritarian control and, and just kind of issues with government that were kind of, yeah, exactly what you said earlier, where people just kind of, you know, put up with it or kind of like made it okay or just kind of ignored it. Like they built and built and built. And then when Saturn came along, yeah, Saturn don't, doesn't fuck around with reality. It says like, this is it right here. You don't, get to, you don't get to ignore this anymore. And you're absolutely right. All that stuff came out and it, all parties, all, you know, all issues. It's not just one thing or the other, like the either or. It's not like it's just Republicans or Democrats. It'll be interesting to see what, plus with Jupiter there this year as well, and Pallas, I don't see it as a negative because to me, like, I love Pallas just because I've never seen a bad transit with Pallas. And this is just looking back at my own personal chart, but like, you know, Pallas is obviously a, you know, it's Athena. So it's like, a, you know, one of the rulers so of it's a wisdom. It is wisdom. It's warfare, but it's like defensive. It's strategy to avoid bloodshed and total yeah, annihilation. Exactly, exactly. And that's where, with that, and you know, Jupiter, I don't see. You know, it's it's like this. Like there's this tension happening, but I'm an optimist, and so I see the the quote unquote positives of those archetypes enacting as well. And like I just see, there's a lot of like, I mean, even with the virus, it could have been so much worse. And that's I think another positive of. Capricorn just I just want to finish with the Capricorn stuff but just that you know for all the bad rap that it gets and all the bad rap that Saturn gets Capricorn in its ideal is still mastery over the material world so what that means is we really do have an opportunity to create a new normal that is actually better and not just a, an authoritarian nightmare um, yeah, I kind of wanted to get into the coming month in astrology, though. I think an astrological weather report might be good for anybody that's listening to this podcast. We can start with the Gemini new moon at two degrees Gemini. It will be on May 22nd. And uh, yeah, that will be just kind of be the start of good old Gemini season, in my opinion. What's, what's kind of great about uh, the new moons over the course of the coming months is they're right at the beginning of a sign, um, which doesn't always happen. Uh, it's right when the sign's starting, the new moon is happening. So there's a certain kind of alignment with the beginning of the season and the, the new moon. So it's the unfolding of this kind of new situation that a lot of us are under. Um, it gives us a good starting point for it. And in the midst of such a kind of crazy astrological retrograde weather that we're under, um, this, is a, this is a good thing. I do, I do want to say something really quick about... Uh, one of the big astrological overlays that we haven't talked about yet that we're, that is going to be with us and for the entire Gemini season. Um, we've got the Venus retrograde in Gemini. And there's a couple of things that I just wanted to say about that really quick. Uh, Venus retrograde is often a time to reevaluate and look, look at our values um, and kind of examine uh, whether those values are actually serving us. Um, it's also a good time to, you know, look at our relationships. So, you know, Venus rules our relationships. It rules uh, kind of our beauty regimen. It rules what we're putting into our bodies to a certain extent. Um, and during this Venus retrograde, it's a good time to kind of look at the way that we're communicating with our partners, the way that we're um, approaching our love life, um, and if we're, if we keep getting weird answers from the universe and keep getting weird people, you know, it might be a good time to uh, figure out why we're doing that instead of continuing the process of doing that. Because one of, one of the things about uh, Venus retrograde is it's definitely the time that you can repeat uh, relationship mistakes um, at a deeper level than the first time around. So <laughs> be aware. It's, it's fun because then, yeah, you, you think you think one thing during the retrograde and then right when it goes direct, you're like, wait, what? Or you think or feel, depending. But yeah, you, and then you're like, wait, what was I doing? Yes. So if you want adventure in your life right now, then go. No, just kidding. Uh, just go for it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> if you want that excitement and chaos, I mean, shit, I think, what is it? Oh, yeah, asteroid chaos is also conjunct. So, hey, let's do it. It's nice. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree completely. And like, I mean, let's see, just... Going back to that that new moon, we have uh, 
the, the Venus retrograde will also be conjunct um, Mercury and Gemini as well. And so it's just kind of, there's a lot happening in Gemini. You know, we have a few asteroids, but also just, you know, obviously the sun, Mercury, Venus. And, uh, you know, uh, the next thing I want to just mention briefly is just that uh, Mercury on, on May 24th, uh, Mercury will conjunct the asteroid Hygieia. And I just bring that up because, you know, the cliche is Hygieia rules among many things, hygiene and just how we take care of ourselves and like, which is, which is sort of a, a social aspect to our, our life because hygiene represents, you know, it's, it affects on a social level. You don't just wash your hands for yourself necessarily. You do it so that you don't spread disease to others. And Mercury conjunct that. I mean, I'm just, it's a very minor transit. I'm not, it's not like some big thing, but just, uh, it'd be interesting. I mean, maybe a new idea about health or just a new idea about like, I mean, I've noticed that like the Hygieia transits have been lining up with like the, um, the, you know, the coronavirus task force um, briefings every day. And yep. just like the, the type of information that they like when they change, like, well, they'll say like, Oh, we recommend doing this. And, or we think that now this is a better thing, or we've adjusted the numbers. Like you can see that changing, like depending on Hygieia being one of them. And so I just, I just want to say on May 24th, uh, Mercury will be conjuncted. So it starts a new cycle for those two together, but it also maybe something might come out. We'll see. One of the ways that I could see that playing out kind of an, on an archetypal level is if you could see a uh, government, because uh, we have a pretty mercurial government because it's run by a, a Uranus uh, North Node Sun in Gemini person. Um, so one of the things that you could see with Mercury conjunct Hygieia is perhaps from the government a little bit more specific um, specific communications about masks and about what kind of protection we should be wearing out in the public, uh, which honestly could help uh, for the political division in the country um, if, if the administration uh, releases something that kind of gets us all on the same page on that. Absolutely. And I, I just want to build off of that because what you are describing is sort of the, the general tone for the month of the Gemini month. And just with a lot of stuff happening in Gemini, it's, and some of these things are going to be squaring like Mars and Ceres and uh, Neptune and Pisces. And a lot of the confusion started, like the confusion around what is correct, what's wrong, like the, the model, like, you know, what numbers are correct, what number, numbers are wrong. Should we wear a mask? Should we not? All of these things you know, started in a lot of, you know, when the sun was in Pisces, you know, we had Mercury retrograding in Pisces back, you know, in March and, you know, late February and stuff. And so now with the square to all of that, yeah, we're going to see sort of exactly what you said, sort of maybe a clarification as opposed to that confusion. Cause you know, Gemini in the positive is very clear in their speech and very clear in the ideas and very uh, just to the point. I mean, they don't, you know, like Sagittarius can go on and on about stuff and, you know, they'll just talk off, you know, soapbox for hours, whereas Gemini is just like, here's the facts, here's the info. So I do agree with that completely. Yeah. And I just wanted to emphasize that for the whole month, there's a lot of that, you know, that those themes are going to be emphasized, just, you know, moving from confusion and kind of, you know, maybe misunderstanding, maybe just kind of whatever it is to, yeah, more, at least information coming out or at least just people kind of being more rational, I guess, is one way to put it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like that that's a possibility, but because of the squares, um, there could also be a big chunk of people that are going deeper into delusion on what political side that they're going to, right? So when Mercury or when uh, Gemini interacts with Pisces, they can tend to really confuse each other, you know? Like, uh, for example, that <laughs> Pisces energy can uh, take some of the claims of Gemini, which are not always super bounded by truth necessarily. Um, and they can like uh, hitch their way into it. Right. And kind of change it according to their own uh, beliefs about what it should be. So you can see people like uh, pushing forward their facts. Um, so instead of the facts, uh, you could see a lot during this month of, you know, uh, kind of opposing sets of facts that are being used to back up people's uh, pre-existing opinions. Well, yeah, those uh, opinions built on that confusion that came because yeah. I, I would argue because it's the first quarter square, it's it's built off of the the initial like if we're basing it off of the archetype of starting with Pisces, it's oh, yeah. the first quarter square. So it's like, yeah, you're right. You're building your ideas off of either 
what is correct and that's great and then you're just you're moving forward and it's a good you're you're absolutely right though i tend to focus on the positive of it which is basically you know you have you you plant the seed and at the first quarter square it's either you know growing properly or it's not and yeah so what you're addressing 100 percent, and that's the part i tend to leave out so i appreciate that is the the not part and basically you're 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 building on top of your confusion your disillusion whatever you want to call it your fantasy whatever you want to call it and uh yep. adding quote unquote facts the gemini or like you know quote unquote your experience your immediate experience of the situation to that confusion that you've built up in your mind so i actually do agree with you completely and i, I appreciate you pointing that out because i tend to just go oh well now everyone will just figure it out and be rational and yay like uh maybe a few but yeah you you're right that's more that's a more realistic expression of the archetype so i appreciate you pointing that out yes so mercury will actually be kind of aligning with uh neptune and mars eventually right so mercury moving into cancer kind of connects with the pisces planets that are out there um it also opposes the capricorn planets that are still around um so what i would say is that people are going to likely move more into their feelings during this period um where their thinking is a lot more influenced by how they're feeling at the time a lot of people are feeling pretty cooped up and they're stuck in their houses um most of their information is coming through their computer screen rather than through actual conversations they're having with people. Um, so one of the things that can happen when Mercury is in cancer is we can kind of get caught up in our feelings really um, impacting our thinking. And thinking tends to get a little bit more muddled during this time. Mercury's not too super at home in cancer. So we might be connected more with the, the Pisces or the higher spiritual side and the less with, uh, less with our, our mind, you know, as, as a whole. And I'm not talking about each individual person because everybody's on their own trip, but as a society, when you're going through the transits, it tends to be like the overlay of energy. And the overlay is people getting more kind of in their feelings. And I would expect that uh you get a lot more of stuff on facebook like if you don't think like me on this uh we shouldn't be friends on facebook anymore but what's interesting is because it's mercury still um people will think it's rational right like that's one of the biggest problems that you have on the internet is people uh feeling that their <laughs> their 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 feelings are kind of true you know and that um when you attack their ideas you're attacking their physical body and then you have an emotional reaction to it, right? And that's when, that's when you really get into kind of uh, troublesome periods. Um, I don't think the Venus retrograde helps this a bunch, um, but there's gonna be people that kind of overreact uh, out in the world and have to pull back from uh, the choices that they make during the, you know, the pre-shadow phase of Mercury moving into Cancer and then you're going to have to walk back some of the, you know, the emotional choices we made and some of the words that we spoke uh, during that retrograde. My Absolutely. God. Yes. I, I understand. It's like, yeah, I mean, not that cancer is always associated with alcohol, but uh, it's like when you have a <laughs> drunken night and you just go on a rant and then you're like, Oh shit, what was I saying? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, it can happen in a lot of ways for sure. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just saying like, like uh, to me, water signs are associated with alcohol. That could just be me. I mean, Pisces, but anyways, it's just kind of that, like it's a similar archetype of involved. But... All right. On uh, May 30th, the sun uh, will be starting a square to Mars in Pisces. And uh, Mars will be retrograding, like we know, in uh, August, or no, excuse me, in September. And uh, it just, the interesting part to me is that the sun, because Mars will be retrograding in the time period that it is, it just so happens that right now the sun and the speed that Mars is, because Mars is slowing down from our perspective on Earth slowly, it isn't at like, its shadow period yet, but it is slowing down. It just happens to be similar speed to the sun so that we're, instead of a normal, well, the sun, transiting sun squaring Mars is, doesn't usually last this long. And so it's just interesting that it's kind of extending it out. And that's where Mars is emphasized a lot this year because it also then, when it retrogrades, it happens to retrograde 
exactly square to all the Capricorn planets. Like it could have been a little before, like in early Aries or a little later in like early Taurus, but no, it happens to be just exactly square. And as well as being conjunct to Eris, exactly square. So it will, it will, you know, form, it will, as it moves forward, it will square all those planets, it will retrograde square all those Capricorn planets, and then forward again, it will square them. And it just adds emphasis to this year. I mean, for lack of better terms, it just, it, it the transits just line up to be like, this is a, a fuck you year from the universe, if you want to put it that way. I just find that interesting. Well, uh, of course, of course. No, no, no. You don't need astrology to know that. I mean, don't get me wrong. But just the astrology of it is just like, wow, let's just fucking like emphasize it more. And, you know, Mars, like on a mundane level, like if you want to be real simple with it, it just adds energy to whatever it hits. Like if real, real simple, like without looking at like all like work and at what it can do, it just, if we just look at it as an energy trigger point, it is like, you know, as it moved through Capricorn and hit all those points in Capricorn, those planets, you know, shit went down. Like we're talking February, March. And then, you know, as it's going to then move to square those same planets and those, you know, square the, where it was, you know, back in those time, it's, it's going to like, you know, going back to the square we were talking about with Gemini and Pisces, like, you know, it can enforce either a positive or a doubling down of the shit. And so it, it is interesting that it does happen to, go into so into the election season but i just going back to on may 30th it's sort of like a a minier version of mars stuff happening and so just the sun square mars can be just i mean it, it to me that will add more emphasis to what we were talking about with that square happening between gemini and pisces and just like the either people doubling down on their ideas that could be completely wrong and rationalizing them or being correct and maybe communicating those ideas in an effective way. We'll see. I mean, obviously that's the positive of it, but. One interesting thing about the Mars square sun, um, especially in Pisces is. So right now we have a lot of people that are, you know, we're socially distancing. A lot of people are socially isolated um, from ideas. You know, they're socially isolated from people that might think differently from themselves. So, Anybody right now that uh, is not like actively seeking out views that differ from them, their own views, can easily easily find themselves in a deeper echo chamber than they usually are in. Um, and all of us, to a certain extent, get caught up in echo chambers. You know, we want our beliefs to be right, so we tend to find other people that believe the way that we do. For example, that believe in astrology, right? <laughs> we find it other people that believe the way that we do. And it's not always a bad thing, but in this period of social isolation, when you're not having like a broad swath of the public that you're coming into contact with, it's much more likely to be um, really kind of focusing on uh, beliefs or focusing on the ideas um, that kind of reinforce your own. And it's more likely to get into kind of fighting spirit about those ideas too. That's the interesting interesting thing about Mars and Pisces is that a uh, spiritual warrior. So that necessitates a certain amount of righteousness. It's not quite the same as the Mars and Sagittarius energy, which is uh, kind of the crusader energy. You know, it's more like the, the crusade. It's not the crusader energy. It's more like the, the martyr energy. The, this is more the energy of the suicide bomber to a certain extent. Right. Uh, yeah, the, this is not the manic street preacher. This is not the uh, Deus Volt <laughs> guy, you know? Um, this, this, is, uh, this is not the God wills it. It's, uh, it. it's more the people that are willing to sacrifice for their own beliefs. But martyring yourself on the internet for, you know, to kind of double down on... So to a certain extent, let's... I, I just want to get into this a little bit more because I really feel like we're going to see more of this. The internet is kind of our subconscious or our conscious outlet for a lot of people right now. That's like the one place that they can express themselves and get things out. And there's certain closed groups on the internet that people are just kind of continually getting their own beliefs kind of reinforced. And the post that says anybody that disagrees with me on this should not be my Facebook friend or what have you anymore. 
that's a martyr post. It's like a, you know, it is like a Mars and Pisces kind of post. It's like, I'm sacrificing my friendship for no longer having to deal with, you know, people that disagree with me. You know, it's like moving into I ideals um, or moving into a kind of a retreat, right? Which is another aspect of Pisces is spiritual retreat, spiritual isolation. So instead of just social isolation, it becomes like kind of a isolation of beliefs and then feeling defensive when you start moving back into society because you've spent time reinforcing those, uh, <laughs> those, those beliefs, whether they're errors or not, you know? Um, the sun, moon, and Mars will form a T-square on uh, May 30th. So just something to keep in mind, um, you know, that day might be a little more interesting and there might be a little more, I mean, it basically everything you've just been talking about will, might be emphasized more with the moon opposite Mars as well as square to the sun with the sun square tomorrow. So just that day specifically will be interesting to see. I think there will be a, like, an, it might either be like a, a, like bring it on strongly what you were talking about, or it will just be like, that'll be, it'll be obvious by that day. So I guess just watch May 30th, see what happens. Um, but, but yeah, just, yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's just a lot of stuff emphasized that day. Um, but, but it will be related to obviously the new moon on the 22nd just because it's the first quarter square to that so it'll be we'll see like on the 22nd notice what's going on and then again on the 30th notice what's going on because those two are related and it will that will then set the tone for the rest of the month um so then moving on to let's see june on june 3rd the sun will be conjunct to the retrograding venus so then you know after that point venus will become the morning star i do want to say one thing uh for posterity about the sun conjunct Venus RX. It's going to be at this point uh, that some of the mistakes that maybe you made during the, the Venus retrograde already, like texting your ex or drinking too much beer or eating too much food or, uh, you know, uh, not keeping with your uh, typical discipline in some areas is going to become pretty obvious. So that's one of the things about the sun conjuncting Venus is it will give you conscious awareness of some of the mistakes you're making during this retrograde if you're making them the key is not to just kind of let it ride the key is to look at those mistakes and hopefully write them otherwise it's going to be a really long retrograde for people that do not uh that do not kind of uh take account during this time so june 3rd put it in your book uh, the things that become pretty obvious to you whether it's your liver hurting or whether it's uh you know the herpes uh coming back up, or just your entire you know value system is just like up and yeah no I I agree with that and uh you know just emphasizing um you know if you have planets at uh, the mutable signs you know midway basically between like uh, five and twenty degrees Gemini or you know of any of the mutable signs you know look at your chart see what it hits because that's where it's retrograding back across so and uh you know and just again just to emphasize um. You know, that is also because Sun is squaring Mars at this time, Venus is squaring Mars at that same time. So it just adds the fun to it, you know, just uh, just what we were talking about earlier about the Sun square Mars. That is also happening while the Sun then conjuncts Venus. So it just adds some extra energy to it. Uh, might add, you know, you might fight your own lessons, I guess, would be one way to put it. So going back, uh, so on June 5th, we have the Sagittarius full moon. It's a partial eclipse at uh, 15 degrees Sag Gemini. And um, this is the first of three eclipses happening. We have three happening in early summer. We will be having an exact full or solar eclipse on the 20th of June. And then, you know, moving into the next month, which we'll talk about in the next video, we have the uh, Capricorn full moon eclipse. It's a partial uh, eclipse and in, on July 4th, which happens to also be the U.S. solar return chart. And uh, we can talk about that next video. What's your sense uh, of Sagittarius full moons? What should we look forward to for that? Um, well, I mean, just with the nodes also being in the signs of Sag and Gemini, I mean, it's, you know, the cliche of don't be a know-it-all. Don't think you know everything. We're, you know, right now is a time of learning. Like, you know, North Node and Gemini for the next, you know, what is it, year and a half? It's a time of learning and a time of being open to experience and a time of, instead of coming at things with your own ideas, like, I mean, that's the cliche of Sagittarius. It's like, I know what's up. So I'm just gonna, I, you know, no one's going to teach me anything because that's a very, you know, the negative of it. It's like, I know what, and we're seeing that, you know, everyone's a know-it-all online and 
like everyone everyone knows what is it the, there's a there's a meme about like i got my facebook phd or whatever it's called like so you know that's going to be a negative i mean and that's going to be emphasized during the sag full moon just because you know it's those two archetypes of like gemini is like in the positive i take in my experience and then i build my knowledge off of that versus sag which is like no i know things this is what's up and you know, sag will apply their ideas to reality and like that can be negative because like you know they might not they might not sync up whereas gemini might like do the opposite and just kind of like not ever come to a conclusion on anything and just kind of just like oh nothing matters because i'll just whatever like maybe it could be this or that and like very just that's when they get the the stereotype of being just like wishy-washy or quote-unquote liars because it's like not sticking to an idea whereas sag will overdo that Jan Spiller writes about the North Node Gemini to have a healthy curiosity and like to have tact, use non-threatening expression of ideas, and to listen to people. And finally, the funniest part is seeking factual information before making decisions. Hmm. Yeah. Well, pulling in the data is like the big Gemini vibe. And then finding the connection between the data for like the wisdom that's locked within the data is the Sagittarius archetype. Um, so when you got the South Node in Sagittarius, it's like, what if you're operating, like this is the danger of Sagittarius. What if you're operating and you think you're operating from a position of wisdom, but you don't actually have the data that backs up your position? Um, in that case, you're operating as kind of a false prophet to a certain extent. You're operating at the, the expert when you don't have a right to call yourself the expert. So, North Node and Gemini really pushes us all to really gather data and gather data that's outside of um, what we normally are aligned with, um, gather data that disagrees with us, gather data from all sorts of people, from all sorts of points of view. Um, instead of thinking that we know the truth, recognize that the truth rests on the foundation of the information. Um, and I feel like that's the that's the energy. So the full moon is a really good chance to kind of do one or the other, kind of. It's a really good chance to get up on our high, for, high horse and then fall to the ground from that high horse because we, we, we didn't put shoes on the horse, you know? We didn't uh, take care of the horse. We didn't, uh, it wasn't bred well, <laughs> so. Hygieia conjuncting the North Node. Um, so for our health, sometimes the best thing that we can do is pull in as much information as possible and then use our discernment to figure out which information we want to follow. Um, take the risk-benefit analysis, the cost-benefit analysis for um, what we want to do for our health. So I think that the big key for Hygieia conjunct the North Node is being open to bringing new information in from a lot of different sources, not trusting just one source, but trying to find as much information as possible before we make any big choices for our health. Um, that's my sense of Hygieia conjunct North Node at 29 degrees. I, I agree with that completely because it, it adds to the emphasis of what you were talking about earlier with the, the you know, the, the nodes and Sag and Gemini and just kind of, yeah, being open to taking in information instead of, coming at it with preconceived ideas and thinking you know it all. So I agree completely. And I think just, yeah, with, with Hygieia the specifically, yeah, it's about, you know, health stuff related and specifically not like health, like in this physical sense, but how, what we do that affects our health. That's more Hygieia, I guess. And like our, like the barrier between us and the world and the actions that we can do and that we can do to basically either prevent or not. And, yeah, so I, I agree with that completely. And uh, I think that's a nice, I mean, it, it keeps becoming emphasized that, yeah, it's like be open to learning and being open to kind of taking in information and try to not hold on to your preconceived ideas in the sense that, yeah, you can have the things you believe and you know, but be open to taking on new information to either alter or enhance your own. But so let's see. Um, Moving right along on June the 11th, the sun will square Neptune, just kind of kind of sealing the deal on the rest of it. I mean, just 
you know, we already talked about the square happening between the sun and Mars in Pisces, but then with Neptune in Pisces as well. Um, you know, on, on June 11th, Mars will become close to a conjunction with Neptune squaring the sun. And then on two days later, on the 13th, Mars actually conjuncts Neptune. So it's just those few days will be, you know, we're adding Neptune into that mix of what we already talked about. And just to really emphasize that side of it and to really like, I mean, I don't, it could be more like people might, you know, slip back into the kind of like their either confusion or their ideas, their certain ideas about things. And, but um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, the square, sun square Neptune feels like uh, confusion to me. Um, it's, it, it feels a lot like uh, those moments in life where you're not quite sure what's, what's real or what's not, and you kind of got to wait and see. Um, there is a lot of crazy uh, media narrative um, from a lot of different directions that, you know, can, can really overblow certain things that are happening. And you can think that something big just happened and then you realize two or three days later um, that it really wasn't anything. Um, for example, there's been a lot of that recently with uh, things that were said in speeches by the president or things that were said in, uh, in, uh, or things that were said by you know, Biden in his basement or what have you. And that's kind of what I'm talking about though, like where something was said and it gets blown out of proportion and then people kind of tripleize around different, different interactions with that information, you know? It kind of feels like going into the weekend, uh, there's a chance for kind of a panic um, about some, something that's come up or some new information that's coming to the fore. Because it is Sun and Gemini, right? And Sun and Gemini is like very information gathering. It's like the reporter energy of the Zodiac. And Neptune is the diffuse uh, spiritual energy of the Zodiac. So really, those two things come together and, and you've got confusion. So don't get too caught up in whatever narrative is being pushed leading into the weekend of, you know, the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th. Because having a, on the 13th Mars conjunct Neptune means that if you're really caught up in that kind of uh, the illusion of it, um, of the media narrative or whatever the case may be, um, you'll be put to put to task for fighting for whatever your interpretation of it is. Um, with Mars conjunct Neptune, we tend to fight for whatever our beliefs are, even if they're root, whether they're rooted in reality or whether they're rooted in our own fantasy. Um, and that's the real danger of this weekend is moving into, especially uh, during that time, you've got uh, the moon moving into Aries pretty much right after Mars conjuncts Neptune. So <laughs> you've got really fighty energy that uh, weekend. And the key is to not get too caught up. And the positive aspect of Mars conjunct Neptune is honestly doing the inner work on your own beliefs. It's uh, instead of taking that fight to the world, take that fight internally. Recognize where you're not living up to your own standards, where you're not living up to your own beliefs and change yourself, you know? It's like the, the, it's like the Michael Jackson song. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at your... Especially in modern times, I feel like, you know, besides all oh, drugs and alcohol, like the idea of like whatever Pisces is, and Neptune is that spirituality. I mean, you know, we have religions, but just the idea of truly trusting in something that isn't just your intellect or just like an outside, you know, information source or outside authority. It's like, you know, whatever that is, you can just call it yourself or your, your whatever, but like, cause ultimately, yeah, with all of this, like none of us have control over everything that's happening. And I'm not trying to like sum that up, but just like, there is that aspect of it where it's like, you're, you're right. Like finding that in yourself, whatever that is for you, as far as being able to find a, a greater sense of calm or peace or whatever, so that, yeah, you don't get so 
caught up in like the other things we we're talking about with like the information and data and like thinking we know everything and then like yeah going online and fighting because you know i'll and just and yeah like the more you can kind of just channel that into like well i could put that energy into kind of just what can i do to like call myself like I and mean, there's a million techniques like it's all based on personality and like your own chart like what works for you but just focusing on like what can kind of bring about an inner internal piece because then that bubbles up to how you interact with people obviously but it's like really focus on that now yeah totally true and i mean at the the highest ideal i tend to have a negative spin on things and it's just all my scorpios so, uh don't hold it against me. but uh the ideal of mars conjunct neptune is your actions aligning with your spiritual truth right so it's like the instead of being at cross purposes like saying that you this one thing but all of your actions show that you don't believe that thing Instead of that, it's you're aligning your actions with your spiritual truth and you're embodying it in your actions. And I think that that's like the, the ideal of Mars conjunct Neptune. Um, it's hard to live up to that ideal, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Even making one step, you know, the whole, what is it? Two steps forward, one step back. I mean, there's the practical side if you want to bring in all the Capricorn stuff of it too, which is like, you know, be, be kind to yourself. Like just one step at a time like it's a mix of individual responsibility which is capricorn stuff as well like people tend to want to just externalize responsibility and then also using like being responsible to like what you were talking about and being responsible like you know you don't have to like figure it all out or find that internal piece or whatever i was mentioning earlier it's more just even like making one step towards that will then take away one step towards the energy being put into you know fighting or whatever the other things we talked about like you know we have x amount of energy in a given day like how are you going to use it and so it's like we that's what we have control over is the choice of how we put that energy into different parts of our charts and how it is interacts with the transits that are happening so yeah i i, I agree with you completely and uh and just building off that then then we have you know a, a few days later on the june 18th um, mercury will go retrograde and uh you know that's at 14 degrees cancer and uh, that'll be fun. And we'll, we'll go more into that for next month because that'll be more the cancer month. But I just want to bring that up because it does happen during the Gemini season. Well, it's, it's really a blessing that Mercury goes retrograde, especially since Venus is also <laughs> retrograde in Gemini. It's really a, a blessing that Mercury goes retrograde at the end of Gemini season because Mercury retrograde during Gemini season is always a lot more harsh. Um, during uh, Virgo season or during Gemini season, Mercury going retrograde really tends to have a bigger impact. So the fact that it's like the last two days of uh, Gemini season is the big blessing of Mercury going retrograde. But to go quickly a little bit further with that retrograde, a lot of the overreactions kind of uh, that we had during um, the shadow period of Mercury and Cancer, like when it was uh, when we we're going through most of the Gemini season, uh, those kind of come home to come home to roost during the uh, retrograde, and we'll get more into that when we talk about Cancer in next month's episode. Um, and the, really, the last thing that happens is on twentieth, we have the Sun conjunct the North Node at twenty nine degrees Gemini right before the Cancer New Moon. Sun conjunct the North Node means that at the end of this Gemini season, we can really realign our perspective and all the information that we've been pulling in over the course of the Gemini season can honestly be used for our own development. Anytime that we have the North Node, it's a possible North Node uh, coming into conjunction with the sun, it's a real possibility for uh, raising our consciousness, our conscious awareness, and all this information that we've been gathering, you know, really over the course of many months, but certainly over the course of the Gemini um, transit, we can start using to, you know, grow a little bit because North Node is about our own growth. It's about our own spiritual or soul growth. And moving forward even when it's hard. So sun conjuncting, it gives us that opportunity to consciously kind of 
graduate, consciously evolve a little bit. Uh, what do we right yeah right before we move into cancer season where we're going to be in our feelings again yeah with that with that <laughs> full-on eclipse so yeah exactly no absolutely I, I i agree with that completely and i think um yeah it sort of is like a, a nice yeah like a, uh, like yeah the final test for that for that class of gemini or like whatever you want to call it like that past month of what we were talking about and just the, the things to watch for and the thing like you know be open to new information, be open to others' ideas and what they say, and don't just come at it with a preconceived notion. You know, don't double down when something happens that's confusing and don't try to just latch onto a certain idea and run with it. And it's like, at that point, it's like, yeah, like, not how well did you do? That sounds too judgy, but it's just kind of like, you know, that's like a nice, yeah, graduation, because then we're going to move into the cancer time. So it's, it shifts the energy completely because then with cancer, we're talking about then you know, squaring to, um, you know, Chiron, or then we have the the late, Capricorn stuff, you know, Saturn and Pluto and Jupiter. And so completely different energy. So, you know, month of Gemini, a lot to do with kind of our ideas, taking in information, um, our preconceived notions of things, and also, you know, our, where we confuse ourselves, where we can confuse others, where we take in wrong information, a lot to do with that. And moving then on to next month, which we'll talk about next month. All right, for the asteroid spotlight for this month, we will be talking about the asteroid Ceres. And technically, it is now a dwarf planet, so one step up from an asteroid in the astronomy world um, on the same level as Pluto. And uh, Ceres orbits between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt, the main asteroid belt, and takes roughly 4.6 years to uh, move once through the zodiac. So what's some of the mythology about it? I mean, okay, so... Besides the obvious story, the Persephone and Pluto and how um, Ceres, you know, how basically to explain why we have fall and winter and why the crops don't grow, there's that whole side of it. Um, Ceres, like her mythology alone, to me, after reading all of it, the most fundamental part of her mythology is she brought agriculture to humanity. So however, I mean, like before that, we were hunter-gatherers, we had no society basically we had no i mean agriculture brought civilized society because mm -hmm. it, it, because you could plant yourself in one place you could set up a town you could set up and you were there every year instead of being like hunter gatherers so i mean historically like that's what she's related to and so that's why she's the goddess of like agriculture fertility fertility in the sense of like life not just you know animal life like you know life plants and anything yeah. Like, you know, not like, um, and then, you know, grains, harvest, motherhood in the sense, I think it's, that's why people relate it to, uh, it's like, I've heard that it's like the, like a higher octave of the moon, which I don't want to get into, but, you know, just for similar archetypes. Um, and so they, they, she was, she was worshiped a ton. I mean, everyone, uh, you know, she, she ruled over what's called plebeian law, which is like the law of man. You know, she was really big into like the things that allowed for a basic civilized society. So like beyond agriculture, like the laws of man, marriage laws. What's, what's interesting about agriculture to me is that it allows you a surplus, which is what allows you to be in one space. So that allows you to winter. It allows you to build walled settlements. It allows you to begin to build civilization. So before we were able to uh, understand crops enough to do that, we were forced to travel kind of through the world wherever you know wherever we could follow food to in mythology Ceres was one of the 12 gods of mount olympus the most major of the deities in greek mythology and she was part of in the same in roman mythology as well and they were called the like i think it's called the de consentes or the di consentes which are just mm. basically like six gods and six goddesses which were like the the elevated pantheon in ancient rome and so she is very important. I mean, she's in, to both cultures, she was on par with, you know, the likes of uh, Jupiter and Neptune and Venus and Mars. And so that's where I think like astrologically, you know, you know, it was, she was discovered, the, the, you know, asteroid dwarf planet was discovered back in the 1800s, but it's used and it was actually used more back then, I believe. But um, I think, you know, bringing it back to kind of elevating its status to at least on the same level as Pluto, because I think it does have, if we're talking about like if the archetypes of the mythology matter then i believe that the archetypes or the you know characteristics 
of the astronomy matter as well in the same way that like, you know, that's why the, the planets are more important than the asteroids. It doesn't mean that the asteroids aren't important, but because Ceres is elevated above just another asteroid, I believe that, you know, there's, that adds to her archetype of the importance in astrology as well, if that makes sense. So Ceres is a dwarf planet within the asteroid belt. Yeah. And also is one of the major uh, pantheon figures of both the Greeks and the Romans. Ceres uh, figured in very directly in the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, right? Like Ceres was right there in the thick of it during that process. Absolutely. And that's that takes us into sort of, we can see all of those archetypes kind of play out this year because yes, Ceres was directly conjunct and I'll, throw the chart up. Ceres was exactly conjunct the Saturn-Pluto archetype or the Saturn-Pluto conjunction at 22 degrees Capricorn um, hmm. with the sun and Mercury as well being right there, you know, by a degree. And all of those archetypes seem to be involved um, in this, you know, the past few months and this year so far. And, you know, with Ceres obviously having to do with food supply and it basically a series has to do with abundance or famine because it's, you know, the, the summer months, like the, the difference between the summer months when she has her daughter and the winter months when her daughter Persephone goes to Hades. Yeah. And so that manifests itself, you know, practically speaking in abundance and, you know, what you were talking about, abundance of crops and being able to like plan for the whole year or famine and like the lack of, and we can, I mean, very superficially, you could see the toilet paper famine, you know, <laughs> I would include toilet paper in that, but also then now, we're starting to get deeper issues with the food supply chain, you know, the meat production oh. issues. And yeah. And so these are all, I think related to Ceres being involved with the Saturn Pluto and Capricorn archetypes. It wouldn't be Ceres on its, on her own. Wouldn't in my opinion, cause this much, you know, global like food shortage and famine. But I think because it's directly tied into these other planets that I think it, kind of blew it up in a way it's it was networking <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah exactly right <laughs> it made buddies with pluto and saturn i've heard about uh the food that uh, so far is that we haven't really stepped into it there's still the capacity or the probability even of a major global food shortage over the course of the winter of 2020 and uh the early parts of 2021 um and seeing definitely the disease spread quickly through some of the meatpacking plants in the U.S. Yeah. It's kind of surprisingly uh, some of the ones that are mostly kind of owned and operated by, well, not operated, but owned by China or yeah. Chinese, Chinese uh, parent company actually own these meatpacking plants. And most of the employees for these uh, meatpacking plants are, Honestly, uh, many people that are uh, that move to the U.S. Uh, that are immigrants here, and it's kind of interesting to see how there's real transformation and how we view our food supply and how much value we put on that network in our country. Um, how much do we want to protect that network? How much? How much is that a national priority? What I've been hearing a lot on, on the news about the meatpacking plants in specific is how much do we want other countries or other national consortiums to own the very basis of light in our country? If we don't have food, we don't have light. How much are we willing to cede that to global markets if it puts ourselves at risk. And that could be kind of how series kind of plays into this, where each country is having to decide how much they're willing to put on the open market and how much they are depending on their own production, um, which could change our consumption patterns over the course of time. The idea of like basically local, I mean, you know, that was, that was blown up the past years or past 10 years. I, I would argue while Pluto was in Capricorn, I mean, the idea of, you know, like, um, local farmers markets got really big. I'm not saying that they weren't there before, but they really seem to blow up into kind of pop culture and just kind of, you know, like, Oh, like local farm and like do your own thing. And like, you know, buy from, and like uh, different like community gardens and things of that nature. And 
you know, that was all nice and it was there, but now it's like, Oh, now it's a necessity because, you know, or not a necessity, but now it's like, okay, that's a real thing that might need to be considered now because can we reasonably continue to get food from all over the world? Can we rely on that, I guess, as versus basically relying on our own beyond just the food supply, the medicine supply, stuff like that. It's, you know, do we have like, you know, we, of course we have it for a good day and when things are abundant, it's great. But yeah, do we have it for the other side of it, the, the famine side of it? Like if there is a quote unquote famine of, which is basically just a, a lack of certain resources, in my opinion, I think it can go beyond food. You know, do we have the ability to make it through the winter basically? And I think that's yeah brought up as well. It's like, uh, and having like, I mean, you know, back in the, during the world war one and world war two, they had something called victory gardens. And it was like, you know, yeah. promoted as like patriotism, like, you know, grow a garden to provide food. Cause you know, a lot of production had to go into the wars and like, you know, you know, we're seeing like, not, it's not that we're in a war now, but we're seeing the national defense authorization act and like the whole idea of like companies having to shift their production and stuff. But just going back to the victory gardens, that to me is like community gardens as well. And it's like, like that might be something that definitely comes back up or people just, and maybe in a more modern way. And we should talk about this in a future episode, but I think that Uranus and Taurus, this yeah. uh, food crisis that we're actually going through right now is very likely to drive innovation in how we grow our food and how we yes. take um, our own needs in the future. Um, so Uranus and Taurus is going to change our farming methods. I think it will probably localize them a little bit more and we'll come up with a lot of new ways to uh, localize our, our, our food supply. The other thing that really jumped up uh, when, I was, when I was thinking about this is actually the Saturn-Pluto series conjunction has basically uh, destroyed farmers markets. So it's destroyed farmers markets uh, while there are more people that are probably setting up uh, markets in their, that, that are setting up gardens in their backyard that's happening more because people have more time in many cases to spend on backyards and gardening and things like that. Um, farmers markets are not happening right now, at least not where I am in Washington. Farmers markets haven't been allowed to even open. So all these things that were kind of created and really started, we probably created around the Jupiter cancer time oh, when yeah. they started becoming really popular are now being opposed by the, the safety concerns of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. So we might have to fight for the right to have farmers markets and to have local production held up as something to aspire to. So that's really interesting. And the less locally self-sufficient we are, the more whoever has the most money can, you know, whoever has the most resources can bring in the food towards themselves in a globalized market, right? And that yeah. might be that might be okay for the US because we have a lot of political power, but they say that people are only like seven meals from anarchy. So <laughs> what about the countries that don't have that kind of pull in a global system? If there's not as much food to go around, somebody is left outside of the table if you're playing musical chairs. So I think it's a really interesting time to be in. I think that the fact that Ceres is part of this major conjunction really lends a lot of weight to uh, including Ceres in serious discussions about planetary aspects in the future. Um, I think probably Ceres as a dwarf planet, at least equivalent with Pluto, should probably be included in Ephemeris, you know? Should probably be included in uh, transit calendars and things like that in the future, considering uh, food is such a core necessity for uh, humans to thrive. There's so many more mouths to feed. Like the world always, I mean, and one could argue like that we still have enough. I mean, that's a debatable thing, but at the same time, like, you know, until recently we, we've never had, you know, we've, there's always been enough land. There's always been enough. It's just a matter of doing the work, but now it's like completely shifted where it's like, it's not even a matter of like, strategically like moving the food to the right places it could be even be the, to the point where yeah like you said there just isn't enough for everybody and like that can be dependent on multiple factors i mean i think one of the positives of capricorn that you know people tend to overlook is 
the structures it can provide, which can include, you know, access to food. I mean, the past 10 years has been the boom, at least in the Western world in America, I can speak um, of just, you can get stuff at the snap of a finger, anything you want, it's there. And that's, that's like the peak of materialism. And to me, Capricorn is in some ways the peak of materialism in the sense of like, how can we push materialism and basically our mastery of the world, which is to me what materialism is to its peak. But then when you do that, then the cracks, I mean, you can only, you know, you go to a peak and then you're like less stable and you have less, you know, you have to like, and I think that's really being rocked right now. Cause it was like, it was so good in the sense that like, you know, in, like I said, in the Western world in America, at least for what I could speak to, like, you know, you could order something on Amazon and literally get it a few hours later. Like that's, and so maybe things have swung too far to where like things are, you know, and the unbalance beyond that, it's like, you know, in America. And like I said, you can get something very quick, anything you want, but there's parts of the world where you can't even get a meal that day. And so it's like, what does that say about the truth about the structures that are in place? Like those structures obviously work for some, like what you were saying a while back, but like they don't work for others. And so that's where those structures, because they don't work for others, then it's going to create that change and transformation because it's forced by that backlash basically. Cause you know, <laughs> You got to eat. I mean, you got to live. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. People get very upset if they can't eat. The empty belly is like the biggest fomenter of revolution ever. And if you look at the Arab Spring, um, which really had a big impact on the world, um, the biggest parts of the Arab Spring were created because bread prices were getting higher and higher and wages were not changing. Um, so, you know, big changes can happen when there's food shortages and I wouldn't be surprised to see some food shortages uh, considering that series was right in the middle of the Saturn Pluto conjunction. All right. Well, yeah. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, Mike, anything else you want to add? Next month. Uh, I hope that we can get a little bit deeper into the cancer Capricorn axis. Um, since we're going to get into the cancer transit of the sun. And it would also be nice to get into America's birthday and uh, the Pluto return that the U.S. is moving into.